Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here. In the past on this channel, we have already taken in-depth looks at the classic beat-em-up franchise known as Final Fight, with the original entry in the series contributing to the evolution of the brawler genre itself and helping to pave the way for many games that it would inspire. There would be many more decent Final Fight games past this point, but it would be difficult to refer to the game we are looking at today as one of them. Final Fight Streetwise marks the final entry in the Final Fight series, and as you can see, it looks and plays vastly different to the old games we all know and love. Within this content, we are going to explore what exactly would occur that would lead to such drastic changes that would result in so much going wrong for this beloved IP. How on earth does something that looks like this become such an ugly, grey, dull looking, completely uninspiring nightmare? Let's find out. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the horrific story of Final Fight Streetwise, the game that destroyed a franchise. Yeah. Final Fight, Final Fight, Final Fight. A game that is still regularly talked about by many today due to its fun gameplay and memorable characters. By this point in time, Cody, Guy and Mike Hager are widely considered video game legends and their romp through Metro City is an experience I choose to go back to time and time again. The game would spawn multiple beat-em-up sequels, however Capcom would eventually change direction as the genre itself began to wane in popularity over time. Despite this, Guy and Cody would find a new appreciation as playable characters within the Street Fighter Alpha series, adding the two warriors to Street Fighter's colourful roster of characters. Considering just how popular the fighting game genre was, the next logical step for Final Fight seemed to be transitioning the franchise from a beat-em-up to a fighting game one. A decision in some ways that was quite ironic, bearing in mind that the first Final Fight game was test marketed as Street Fighter 89, with arcade vendors putting forward the opinion that the name was unsuitable, as the game was too different to the original 1987 Street Fighter. But I guess who cares, every other franchise such as Turtles and Double Dragon will be turned into Street Fighter like fighting games, so why not Final Fight as well? Bizarrely, this ugly fighting game known as Final Fight Revenge would not show up in the arcades until 1999, and would not arrive in homes until the year 2000, looking extremely dated in comparison to titles available on other hardware. This abomination was developed by Capcom USA, a California-based Capcom subsidiary that would later change its name to Capcom Studio 8. Rather amusingly, despite being the first American-developed Final Fight game, Revenge was not released in the USA, due to the fact the game was developed to ultimately see a home release on just the Sega Saturn, a console that by the time the game was ready for release had been completely phased out in the West, due to the Saturn having such low sales numbers outside of its home country. This American game would remain a Japan-only exclusive. As for the American division of Capcom who created this game, past this point they would develop a game known as Maximo in 2001, a 3D hack and slash platforming video game directed by David Silla, the producer of the original Crash Bandicoot title. For those who have never tried Maximo, it is a decent game that would receive favourable reviews, and most interestingly of all, it is a game that is set in the same universe as Ghosts and Goblins which was made slightly more obvious in the US market due to the game being released as Maximo Ghosts to Glory. In 2003, a sequel was released to this game known as Maximo vs Army of Zin, which would feature similar gameplay and also receive very decent reviews. Maximo was a success for the Americans working for a Capcom subsidiary. Along with finding a level of success creating games to expand in the Ghosts and Goblins universe, Studio 8 were tasked with creating the next instalment in the Final Fight series. Before we finally arrived at Streetwise, the studio spent a great deal of time working on a cancelled Final Fight title that was known as Final Fight Seven Sons. Unlike Final Fight Revenge before it, as you can see from this footage from Unseen 64, Final Fight Seven Sons would take a lot more influence from the Final Fight beat-em-ups of old, in that it offers a simulated RAL camera perspective, which is obviously a different approach to the more free-moving cameras that were present in the majority of 3D polygonal-based games at the time. This would mean the camera follows the playable character from left to right, 
as they make progress. While it was clear that this game was never finished and still required a lot of polish to see a release, we can identify from this footage that the game would offer an unknown playable character, along with slightly cartoonish cells shaded graphics. According to Unseen64, the corporate side of Capcom despised many elements of this prototype game and felt that the graphical style was not at all suitable for an American audience as the presentation was not geared to looking gritty enough. I guess logically this makes sense, as with most western made games in this particular era, they felt like they were all being manufactured to look gritty. Basically a bit dull, washed out and grey looking. Depressing ugly stuff, especially to now look back on when the polygon graphics themselves have aged poorly too. Comparing this to the world of architecture, it reminds me of back in the 1960s, when somehow a building style known as brutalism became fashionable leading to many extremely ugly structures being designed and built, which also, like PlayStation 2 graphics, aged generally like milk. Thankfully, both in gaming and architecture, this style would go out of fashion, and many of these buildings would be renovated or knocked down completely, helping to restore colour to all of our lives. But sadly for Final Fight 7 Sons, a release of this game with its current direction was never to be simply due to being a victim of video game brutalism. Capcom Studio 8 developers are informed that they could continue developing a game with brawler aspects they had been working on, but everything else had to change, to provide a theme American gamers could appreciate. It is also highly likely that Capcom's decision to send their team in such a direction was down to the success of the Grand Theft Auto series, games that were believe it or not published by Capcom themselves over in Japan. These games were to sell extremely well over there, which as you probably know is not even that hugely common for western developed titles. So somehow it seemed that Capcom wanted Final Fight to become a lot more Grand Theft Auto like, which is why the Final Fight streetwise we all know and well, don't care about, would feature both an art style and gameplay mechanics that were drastically removed from any Final Fight game that had come before it. A cell shaded beat em up was out and a dull grey looking game with mass urban thug appeal that was planned to be delivered in a market that was already oversaturated with that kind of cash grab rubbish was apparently in. I wish I was paid as well as stupid corporate marketing executives, they get to have all the fun and make all the money. So likely without the budget that was pumped into the Grand Theft Auto series and a team of only 25 people what exactly were Capcom Production Studio 8 actually able to come up with when it comes to delivering a game that fulfilled ticking every box on the ridiculous brief that it needed to cover? Well, since higher-ups were fond of the beat-em-up mechanics themselves, Games got a game with more of a sandbox feel that retained the combat of Seven Sons. Speaking of these 3D Grand Theft Auto-inspired games, Capcom would also choose to develop Beatdown Fists of Vengeance in Japan, another game that seems to have featured a similar design brief which would also be panned by critics on release. Final Fight Streetwise would follow this fouled game one year later, seeing release in 2006. Rather than playing as one of the established cast members from the Final Fight universe, this time gamers take control of Kyle Travers, the younger brother of Cody who obviously featured as a key character previously in the series. To be fair to the game, artistically it does at times try a little more than simply imitating Grand Theft Auto. In fact, the game's opening scene which sees Kyle amidst a bare knuckle prize fight being managed by Cody, the whole thing is reminiscent of Guy Ritchie's British gangster movie Snatch, with both the editing of the scene and Travers' inner monologue voiceover providing narration as to who all the other characters in this opening cutscene are, even acknowledging Cody's legendary past. I love the movie Snatch, so I adore this scene, which then leads to a one-on-one -on -one fight allowing players to get to grips with this game's beat-em-up mechanics. As for the story of Final Fight Streetwise, Cody ends up getting captured and the game follows Kyle as he roams the gritty streets of Metro City doing detective work in a quest to rescue his beloved brother. The game seems to follow events that were established within the Street Fighter Alpha series, as Cody is an ex-convict who chooses to steal wear his orange shirt from his time in prison. In perhaps the grittiest, edgiest story in Final Fight history ever, Cody has gotten him way over his head this time, becoming involved with a new drug that has appeared on the market known as Glow, an addictive substance 
that makes light shoot out of the user's eyes, giving them superhuman strength. Kyle must do everything possible to locate his missing sibling and help him get out of this mess. Just like with GTA games, the title tries its best to deliver a game that features a free roaming environment where players can even choose to progress the story or opt to accept side quests that flesh out the game. Across the game, a lot of ridiculous stuff occurs, such as in the early stages where gamers take part in using beat-em-up mechanics to exterminate all of the cockroaches in a restaurant, or the most bare-bones minigame ever imaginable, such as slide puzzles that players can endure. Between the game's many story missions like Grand Theft Auto, there are tons of cutscenes that break up the action and help progress the story. As one would expect, the game carries itself like a 13-year-old boy, trying to appear as cool in school as possible, taking every minute to insert as many swear words as possible, along with other vulgarities that seem to be placed in the game, driven by the orders of, let's make a game that appeals to the core American audience. In terms of beat-em-up mechanics, probably the best thing about this ridiculous game, None of it is anything spectacular, but it is functioning with points in the game where players must dispose of multiple enemies at once. Paired at times where the gamer must dispose of bosses who can apply a little bit more strategy in their combat. Speaking of moves, combos can be purchased in the game in order to build on Kyle's arsenal. Once again, like Grand Theft Auto, players do not even need to know how to navigate around this ugly mess of a city themselves, as following a huge bright arrow can lead players from point A to B in order to avoid getting lost. In some ways, playing this game as Kyle is the video game equivalent to watching Star Wars The Force Awakens, as while the lead character for the game is a new one, throughout the story he eventually encounters many of the old favourites, allowing players to learn about what happened to each of them post the events of the original games. This of course includes Mayor Mike Hagger, who now lives a quiet life out of the spotlight, now running his own shipyard and gym with most of the people of Metro City forgetting he ever was the mayor. Mike's role in the game is training Kyle in his gym and informing him where he can find Guy. With regards to redesigning of characters such as Guy for a more gritty realistic environment, according to the game's concept artist Trent Kanugia, he mentions it was tough redesigning classic characters for such a game. He states he wanted Guy to feel more modern and fit into the universe they were making but said people on the team advised him to ensure that he maintained his classic elements to remain recognisable to gamers. But simply putting him in normal clothes rather than more anime looking outfits was a big part of how he would change things up, to give the game that realistic image they wanted. There are also some cool cameos here and there, such as Kami appearing in the game from the Street Fighter series, who can be competed against in an underground pit fight. The game's artist also mentions that he drew a concept image of Kami for her to appear in another cancelled Capcom game, which was set to be a Kami first person shooter. So that's another bit of obscure trivia relating to this crazy game. In one of the bar scenes in this title, players will also notice the game features an original Final Fight arcade cabinet set up. And one of the saving graces of this title is that generously, Capcom offered the entire original game as an unlockable feature within Streetwise, which is a lovely little bonus feature, and far more generous than what the most publishers would do with their games today. As for how this strange mismatch of a game was received, GameSpot would slate the game, giving it only 3.3 out of 10, chastising it for its ugly graphics, horrible speech, lame gameplay, needless cursing, hokey script, and awful camera angles, highlighting that the game's only good feature was that players got to meet Mike Hagger again. IGN would bury the game too, stating, Can Final Fight's pedigree of being one of the best-loved beat-em-up arcade games of the early 90s remain intact with Streetwise? No, it can't. The latest release of Final Fight attempts to dress up its action core in absurd and occasionally infuriating minigames, an inane storyline, and an oppressively small game area. Furthermore, the game suffers from a camera that seems to have penchant for making things as difficult as possible. GameSpy would add, Final Fight is one of those great coin-op games from Capcom's past that should be locked away and treasured forever. Final Fight Streetwise, on the other hand, is perhaps the best argument one could make against remaking arcade classics. Eurogamer would annihilate the game, commenting, Final Fight Streetwise is a remake no one asked for, to be filed next to Sega's Altered Beast 
or Midway's NARC as completely pointless retreads. Fair enough, it's not completely broken and you can play through it, but you could go outside and play with a crisp bag and pair of Tramp's shoes if you wanted to. As a modern brawler, Final Fight Streetwise is worthless. Across the board, Final Fight Streetwise would be the most panned Final Fight game of all time, which neither managed to captivate long-term fans of the series, nor did it get a decent slice of that gritty GTA pie. The game would essentially fail on all fronts, pretty much pleasing no one in the process. Shortly after the release of Final Fight Streetwise, Capcom would close down Studio 8, meaning this game would be the last one that the studio would ever end up producing. The game is the very embodiment of a title trying to capitalise on what was popular at the time, rather than simply trying to deliver the greatest gaming experience possible, with likely a better game being developed if Studio 8 had of simply continued to improve Final Fight 7 Sons. The game is a prime example of what little faith higher-ups had in classic gameplay formats during this era even forcing their staff members to go outside of their comfort zone to try and deliver a game that was close to impossible to have gotten right. Sadly, since this day in 2006, we have never received a new Final Fight game, with 15 years now passing since Streetwise. Despite this, many of the characters have lived on through the Street Fighter series, and I would not entirely rule out a return of Final Fight to its roots with a new classic 2D video game down the line. After all, Streets of Rage has found success reverting to a playstyle of the past, so in theory this should work for Final Fight 2. But due to the failures of the least Streetwise idea for a game ever, Streetwise, the bad decision implemented by Capcom executives would scare Capcom out of developing future Final Fight games for 15 years and counting. This game destroyed the franchise, which has remained in hibernation ever since. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was the At Point's horrific story of Final Fight Streetwise, finally rounding off my long-running series of videos covering every Final Fight game ever made. If you want to see my other Final Fight videos or other beat-em-up retrospectives I've created, be sure to subscribe and check out my backlog. If you want to chat about future uploads, you can find me on twitch.tv slash live every Tuesday and Saturday, and you can talk to me on my Discord server by clicking the link on the pinned comment. I would love to get to know more of my viewers a little better, so come say hello to me in either of those places. Finally, I would like to provide a huge thank you to those who choose to back this channel on Patreon. You make working full time on YouTube more easily achievable. So with that said, special shout outs go out to Sebastian Velez, The Murder of Crows, Carl Johnson, Heo Paulo Lopez, Nostalgia Collector, Ben Harrod Dying, Corey I. Marsh Sr., Capcom vs. SNK, BXL Gotham, Rowan Dinch, Evan Border, Philip Manth, Azrael Rawakai, Keith Ferguson, Jock and Varela, Michael Cullix, Aigo, Jordan Durant, Age Light 85, Ian Boyle, Nick Daniels, Prince Azana, Daniel Daly, Computer Man, House of the Ted, Gary Pinkett, EC Professor, Kid Anime, Justin Wang, Aaron McNamara, Hermes Gonzalez, Instant Gratification, Monkey Man, Shovel, James Bishop, JB, Michael Hall, Wesley Sanghee, Felatio, Langston Miller, Noob, Brian Barry, Sarah Powell, Vlamic Renee, Marvin Oliga, Chris Cool, TOG Driver, Adrian Hannington, Bernard NG, Richard Stu Stewart, Dan Verdamic, Lewis Fiant, John Bates, David Bowell, Chris Fisk, Mike Bruno, Rick67, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Retroverse.com, Casey Wright, Synth Spaces, Zai, Andrew Bozanski, Alex Summers, Gunther Hendricks, and everybody else who backs me on Patreon. Thank you so much for all of your support. Appreciate it. Yeah.